I have uh, my writing sample. Oh, okay. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah, you Thank you. That. Yep, I will I keep that. You it now or Thank you very much. Sooner. I'll keep it. I tell you what, I won't read it right now. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Okay. Um, well, so we have about 50 minutes okay. and probably 10 questions. So sure. you can, um, the clock is right there. So hopefully it's going to be working and you can allocate your time accordingly. But um, I just wanted to start off by thanking you for coming back and um, inviting you to tell us a little bit about why Hopkinton and why now. Well, thank you first for having me. And I, I need to say from beginning to end of this process, uh, you've all made me feel very comfortable. Uh, through the duration. I loved my day yesterday meeting with staff, administrators, parents along the way. Um, the tours were, were exceptional. Um, just a great place. You, you can feel the culture of, of a district in the first five minutes you walk into your schools and you have it here. I think I said in some of my interviews, uh, just in my circles of, of superintendents, in, in talking about one district to the next, they, they've said, and this starts to answer your question of why Hopkinton, Hopkinton is a district that's about to take off. Um, so, as I was concluding my final year of my second uh, contract, so six years I've been in, in Uxbridge, if Hopkinton opened last year, I think a number of people on my committee knew that I would be pursuing it. We've been very open about that, and uh, it's a destination district. I uh, have not been shy about that fr from day one. So, um, that's why Hopkinton. Um, and Again, some of you will probably hear me say the same thing a few times because you've been part of the process <laughs> since the beginning. So uh, I'm sorry for that, but that's uh, what I'm about and who I am. I'm pretty consistent with my beliefs. So there are three types of school districts uh, that, that you lead. Ones that need transformative change, ones that are, one that may be on the cusp of being good or great, and then those districts that are ready to take off. Um, so every leader has situational leadership skills. They change by day, they change by situations. But there are a core group of skills that you hope you lean on more than others throughout the course of your week, month, and year, uh, from one year to the next. And, and for me, that, that's a collaborative leadership style. Uh, I, I believe in distributive leadership. So being a spoke in the wheel, everybody has a leadership role in some capacity, but it's a different role to make the ship sail. And Everybody, Hopkinton is one of those communities where there is a high level of involvement. There's a desire to be involved, and I desire to work in a community where people want to share the steering wheel. Thank you. So as you know, Hopkinton mm -hmm. is a community that invests in its education and its schools, and we're really proud of what we have accomplished here. But I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about what your vision would be for sort of where the next steps would be or what, what your vision for Hopkinton going forward. Sure. Um, again, Hopkinton is not only a destination for aspiring superintendents to be here, but it's a place where people want to live and raise their, their families. Um, from what I've learned and what I've heard, uh, the, the population in, in uh, Hopkinton is growing at a faster rate than any of the other communities in, in this region. Um, and you should know that most regions throughout the Commonwealth have declining student enrollment. So people are moving here for the schools. Let's be, let's be, be clear about that. So what would be that next step? Um, you already have high MCAS scores. There's no doubt about that. You're 20 to 30 points higher than the state average. You have high SAT scores. You have high graduation rates. You have a high percentage of kids going on to competitive colleges. But it's not just about the transcript. And I think this is something that I would bring to Hopkinton because I think our mission as a community, as an education leadership team, is to grow and develop young people into successful independent citizens who are prepared to take on the challenges of their adult lives. And let's be frank, we're not talking about building just 21st century skills. We're already a quarter way through to the 21st century. We're talking about challenges that we don't know will be there yet. We're talking about building skills with children for jobs that haven't been invented yet. We have a role in that. So what I would bring to the table is expanded partnerships with higher education, with the business community, with the Chamber of Commerce. One of the things that we're working in Uxbridge right now is we're developing early college programming. So as many families, and you do invest in education here in the K-12 system, with the expectation that you're going to be making a heavy investment into higher education as well. 
there is a debt burden, it, burden issue going on with higher education. So if you're thinking of a private college, you're looking at to start 50000 a year. To start. We have a responsibility, I think, for families who are making a high investment in a community like Hopkinton or anywhere where what can we do to allow kids to start earning college credits while they're in high school and not just like an AP class. We'll continue to offer AP courses, but we'll establish partnerships with colleges so that our teachers are part of that faculty pool for that school, teaching that college course, their curriculum, and applying credits, college credits, before they're graduating. So we're looking at Uxbridge in the next three to five years of having kids graduate high school with 15 college credits, if not 30. We're striving for an associate's degree for kids, thus lessening the, the, the college debt for, for families and making kids more marketable at those most competitive levels of, of, of schools in higher education. What I would bring is a focus, at, even at the primary levels, of starting to dream with kids and setting time aside in school of what do you want to be when you grow up. We're formulating goals of what they aspire to be, even as the youngest children. People around the holidays will be sitting around with fire trucks and police cruisers with their young ch children, and they'll be talking about wanting to grow up to be a fireman and a policeman or a teacher or something. Take that. Hold on to that. And as they progress from one grade, grade level to the next, and as we use data about them and what they're learning in their classroom and seeing where their skills and strengths are and even weaknesses, how does that shape into academic and lifelong learning goals? So when we talk about management of stress, and I know this is a big issue in this community, as it should be, um, in any community, we have to really be attentive to what students can take on because they have busy schedules, they have competing values with what they want to do, they have social challenges. Many of, through half of their life here with you, they're going through social, physical, and emotional changes all at once. It's the trifecta, it's the perfect storm of going from a child to an adult. And we have to be sensitive to that. So I think I'm a big believer in goal planning. I'm a big believer in setting up flexible schedules in your schools so that you can talk about these issues. So as we're talking about goals that lead to pathways, and we will start designing course pathways, academic pathways that fit the kids, that fit the workforce market of what's needed around you in the society. You have 60 colleges within a 25-mile radius. You have high-tech, biotech in your backyard. They want to partner with schools. We have higher education who want to partner with schools. They're the perfect marriage. That's what we're doing in Oxbridge. I think that's what I can bring here. Um, the school budget typically makes up about 52% of the, the overall town budget. Um, how would you, give, given the constraints of municipal budgeting, how would you partner with other town boards and departments to ensure that we could build the most responsible mm -hmm. town-wide budget while ensuring that we have appropriate investments in our schools? Um, well, well, first, even before you, you, you we're talking about the 52 or 54 percent, you said 52? 52. 52% 52 split. Um, I think your operational budgets for the school are increasing by 4%. On, on an annual basis, Roughly. you know, o over you know yeah. a period of time, and that's a dream for me. First of all, not to to set you up um, in negotiations, let's say, with finance committee and boards of selectmen and the town manager, but um, clearly you want to advocate for the needs of children, but not at the expense of your other municipal departments. What Hopkinton is about, and I have many people on the ground here, in, in, in terms of families and friends, that. Having all of the uh, um, family and youth services, uh, you know, fire police library, the beautiful library that has just been renovated, that in the school system, that's what makes up a community. So uh, I, I've said this in, in earlier interviews, uh, what we try to do in, in my community where I'm working is, I want to be in a place where I'm advocating for those other departments and for those needs. It sends a message to the community when a department from, from another for the school department leader to be advocating for the Department of Public Works. And it, and it, looks, it looks good, and, it's, and this isn't just a for show. This is real. You have to work on those relationships so that they can advocate for your needs when you need them. It's a partnership.
So as it those are just department heads. For um, a finance committee, the boards of selectmen, hopefully we have li liaisons here that we can keep people up to speed. If people know what, what you need up front, they can help advocate um, for those needs and services too. And I want to be in a position where I'm in the know what you need, to, what you need me to speak to. Mr. Carney, can you tell us um, a little bit about challenges that you're facing in your current district related to special education? Mm -hmm. And how have you worked with your current team to make improvements? Mm -hmm. And how do you envision the role of the superintendent in addressing these challenges? Prior to becoming a superintendent, I was a director of education at another district um, placement school for a year and three months. Um, it was a temporary stay, but it was one of those moves where um, you come across people in your life when they ask you something, to do something for them, and you just can't say no. So I, I left my prior community of, of Ashland, where I had been working for 14, 15 years, uh, to take on this different role, this very different role. But what I learned um, of what we can do in public education for special education students, uh, it just blew my mind. And so w some of the things that I've done in, in Uxbridge is first and foremost for kids that, have, that are suffering with social and emotional disabilities, psychiatric disorders, uh, I partnered with the, the neighboring community to, uh, and a human uh, or a health agency to provide clinical therapy in our middle school and high school twice a week. We brought in psychiatry services once a month so that for kids and families, uh, they don't, if, if through insurance, if they can qualify, they, they don't have to pull their kids out of school to go see their, their therapists and, and psychiatrists. We, we can bring those services to them in school. That's one thing. Um, I, my goal as the superintendent is to make sure we're doing everything that we possibly can to have our students educated and raised in the community where they live. So if we're struggling to meet those needs and we don't have the resources to provide that education and quality of service here, I want to be involved. Maybe I'm not at that team level with the special, edu special education director and team chairs and parents and teachers who are making those decisions, but I hope that I'm consulted and I can uh, interject when necessarily if, if they need assistance and finding the closest place that has the specialized program for those kids. So that's goal number one right out of the gate. Um, for our inclusion and, and other services in-house, we're trying, I guess this is the same story. We're trying to make sure that we're, we're providing an education in the least restrictive environment as possible. We want these kids mainstream together. And when they need pull-out services, that we're doing it in a way that it's not a majority of their day. And if it's a majority of the day, it's going to be a joint decision, and, 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 and families and the educators need to believe that this is in the best interest of the child. Because again, back to the original goal, we want all of our kids being independent, successful citizens. And the only way that we do that is by challenging them and by providing them that crutch when they need it and that accommodation that they do to find where their strengths are. So over time, those individual education plans should be tinkered and hopefully agreed upon to test where those skills are because eventually we want all the kids living on their own in high-skilled, high-wage jobs. So to come back to the original point of your question, I meet with our pupil services director who oversees special education every single week and we're talking about where are those cases that, uh, that aren't going well and how, where can I provide supports. Every week we're meeting with a full administration team and we're talking about special education services as part of what's happening in each of the buildings and how are we making sure that we're being inclusive for all students. So it's constantly being discussed and I'm constantly directing those conversations. Can I ask a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. Just quickly. Of course. So when you say bringing counseling and psychiatry services in mm -hmm. through an agency, is the school funding those or those being funded through private insurance or a combination? Um, private insurance, uh, not private insurance necessarily, um, for the staffing that's handled by the agency. Both districts pay a nominal fee of, I want to say, a couple thousand dollars for, to, you know, to maintain this partnership. The area hospital contributes to it. So it's 
above and beyond what uh, we provide in staffing for school psychologists, guidance counselors, adjustment counselors. It's those students who need more. But is it open? I guess my, my yeah. question is more, is it open to all students or just students? No, with and we handle, it, we handle it very discreetly. Um, it's not something that's necessarily marketed out there because these are kids that need, you know, significant um, therapies, okay? So and, and for the protection of their identities, the offices are in a place that people aren't necessarily uh, aware about. And it's really been a benefit because some of these kids are being pulled out of school or they were being pulled out of school for days at a time each month to go into Boston, to go into Worcester, to go to these far Parents had to miss work to do this. So we partnered together with an agency, with the hospital, with another district, so that it's serving both communities for at-risk kids. Okay. Thank you. You're good. You're good. Any question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, Mr. Carney, you mentioned earlier that you're aware of uh, our community is growing, um, and with that comes some shifting demographics. So what do you see as the challenging aspects of an increasingly diverse community, and what kind of leadership efforts do you think are needed to encourage a commitment to excellence through that diversity? I, I don't think I said this at the beginning. It's one of the pillars of a strong system now and moving forward. So when we talk about what's going to be the profile of a strong, successful student that's going to be an independent uh, citizen someday, it's our system building a strong literacy action plan. And I know that's in the works now because Dr. Kavanaugh is here and I hired her in, in Uxbridge and, in, you know, and that was the focus, you know, the primary focus, goal number one, when we came together. Um, and then obviously building numeracy skills, technology skills, cultural intelligence for our kids and our staff as well as building soft skills. And we'll probably talk about some of those other elements later, but as, it, as it's specific to your question, um, what am I gonna do or what are we going to do together? First of all, let's embrace it. People are wanting to come here because of who and what you are. Now we have to adapt to the differences of cultures that come into play. And I keep bringing this up, it, this has been, tattooed to my brain several years ago when a former superintendent said to me once from, from Hopkinton, you know, I didn't really value studying abroad that when he was growing up or even when his kids, I think, were coming through schools. Um, but today we're living in a different era where your boss may say to you, pack your bags, you're going to Shanghai for two weeks. There's an important deal that needs to get done and we need you to take care of that. So we have to have an understanding of different cultures and authentic uh, differences in cultures uh, because we're not just, we may be the melting pot as the United States, but many of the people who have been, for instance, my wife is, is from Portugal, first generation here. Um, her culture is very different in her family than Framingham or Natick or Hopkinton Portuguese, people who have been here for multiple generations. It's just different. Many of those different cultures who, that have been here have been Americanized, if, if you will. But now you're seeing a, a huge influx of first generation cultures. I, I said yesterday, in 2015, 64,000 students enrolled from India and China directly into Boston area colleges. Whether you're not seeing them here right now, and I know you are, um, your kids are going to be sitting next to them in classes. They're going to be sitting next to them in board meetings. Our world, as you said yesterday, Jean, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller week by week. Let's embrace that. Um, and we're going to hopefully somewhat talk about pathways tonight, academic pathways. I received a great question by text of saying, what are you going to do with the changing um, the diverse population when your teaching force is pretty much over 90% white? How do you handle something like that? And first, it, it's, you know, again, exposing those different cultures. You, you can do plenty of research proje projects with kids. You can do um, uh, field trips with them. You can do what I did in Uxbridge and enrolling foreign students into your school and put them in classroom and they're first generation and they're here to learn about you 
they're really here to study about your cultures and they're embracing them. And what they've learned over time is that kids are kids. They come from different backgrounds, they come from different values. And the more you expose them to that, the more they appreciate it. I married into something and my mind has changed forever. I've been, I, I live in Framingham, there are nine elementary schools. My wife and I send our kids across town and we enrolled our kids in an elementary school where the population is 27% white. My kids are bilingual, my wife is trilingual. They'll tell me that I speak half of one language. Um, but this, th this cultural intelligence is something that's very, very important to me. It's at my core. It will continue to be at my core when I come here. And really, it's celebrating those differences and how can we incorporate that into the curriculum. We know we have a critical shortage in teaching. So as you embrace the diversity, we could also help the workforce with partnering with, again, colleges and inspiring kids of Asian descent, Indian descent, Hispanic, all of the backgrounds that you have, encouraging them to be teachers because they have a, a culture to represent and customs to represent and we want them in front of the classrooms. We're not going to shift that until we start inspiring kids into that, the, the teaching pathways so that they are better represented. And that's an, not just a, a, a Hopkinton challenge, it's a, it's a nationwide challenge. Right now, the people that look like most of us at the table are the minority majority in the student population across the country. By 2040 or 2042, the entire population, white Anglos, will, will be the minority majority. So we have to adapt. Let's get ready, so let's embrace it. Thank you. So as superintendent, you wear two really important hats. One is as a leader of educators, and one is as a leader in the community. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about what you think your um, strengths in each of those arenas are, as well as maybe an area of growth for you in each? Mm -hmm. in each um, I think the strength for me in that area is I want to be out there where, well, let me, let me rephrase that. It's constant. It's a bigger part of the job than people think. This isn't a nine to five job. It's, a, it's an eight day a week job. So your cell phone better be well charged. You better be ready to uh, go to, for instance, tomorrow I will be in Natick uh, with the meeting with the president of a community college, with the board of selectmen member, with the finance committee member, with the school committee member, with an ad hoc member of the community, trying to come up with something innovative and entrepreneurial. To, to help, uh, you know, an income, a revenue issue that we're dealing with in, in the community. So um, my approach is everyone's on speed dial for me, from each of those boards, again, to, to some higher ed officials, to chambers of commerce, um, and we're constantly in communication and dialogue. So as a school committee, and I'm sure it, those of you, and I think some of you have been on the board for a while, I joke even with some of my members, I have a seven member board. So there's an actual school committee meeting, but I have seven, sometimes seven meetings about the meeting before the meeting happens. Mm -hmm. I do that with finance committee members, our liaisons, I do that with board of selectmen um, and members when we need to educate people on what the needs are. And just being available and accessible whenever possible. I mean, and I shouldn't even say whenever possible. That comes with the territory. I've learned that as a superintendent over six years. When you're needed, you're needed. The, there is no clock. Um, but collaborations, too, on joint uh, ventures is, is critically important. This goes back to um, a prior question of how do you work with other department boards and, and department leaders? It's got to be collaborative. And again, it goes back to my initial point. Of, the more I can lean on my, my core skill of collaboration, the better off I am. I think the better off everyone else is around me, too. Um, because that's how I need to function. Thank you. Can you share with us two risks that you've taken as an educational leader, uh, one that worked out well for you and one that did not work out so well for you, and what you learned from that and how you incorporate that into your current practices? Okay. Um, I, I think speed kills is something that I've learned to, to love. Um, it, there, there's also another cliche of, you know, you got to strike when the iron's hot. 
But uh, earlier in my career as superintendent, I talked about international education and bringing, um, I wanted to bring culture change. It wasn't happening fast in the community, so I wanted to bring another world to it. <laughs> okay, and in the early years, I think it went well. We did do a litmus test, and I worked with four other communities to bring in 18 students from China and put them into host families for a week. And that went well, you know, the week-long thing. But then we started, we made the shift to enrolling them, you know, for a year. Um, so that was a goal of our first school committee. And with me, they embraced it, they thought it was innovative, they thought it was going to sh make a culture shift for the community. I think the kids did really well with their foreign peers. Um, but then, as you know, sometimes things flip overnight. Elections happen. I've had 16 or 17 school committee members in five plus years, five chairs in, in six years. So values change for a thing. I think that was a great risk, but didn't gauge at that time that the values shifted. Well, I may still have had that, still wanted to push forward with it. I probably pushed it forward in the following years and didn't read the fact that some of the members and some of the communities weren't just, they just weren't quite ready for that yet. If that makes sense. It was, I think, a mistake on my part to not read that earlier and say, hey, maybe we should adapt this goal. We've articulated, we've agreed upon it, but if we don't want to do that, let's change that. And I probably pushed a little too hard with it. Now comes a more successful one. It's not complete, but it's very timely, so I'll talk about it, is we have a very old building. We have four, four schools uh, declining enrollment in the community. The message to me has always been, be patient, Kevin. You know, it's going to be a couple tight years. You're going to have to tighten your belt with resources. There will probably be some cuts. But business is coming. Business is coming. Business is coming. Well, there have been a couple of opportunities that have been shut down at town meeting where uh, it would have brought millions into the community, but the community didn't want it, and you have to respect that, but it would have solved a number of problems. So I've had to make a bold move in reading this uh, about a year ago and putting a study group together to work with the MSBA and hopefully get them to um, not recapture a last year in a grant um, for that building. So there is, you know, we had to work on a reconfiguration plan. So I had to reconfigure the district when I came into Uxbridge when they built the new school. And six years later, I had to work with the reconfiguration plan again because that fourth school isn't needed and the data doesn't support that it's necessary. So what we're going to do is we're going to close it we're going to move students to other grade levels, I mean to other buildings. And the school committee voted on that with the understanding that this 400000 is not going to be shifted over to the tax levy. We're still working on a plan so that it doesn't hit the backs of, of, of homeowners and try to shift debt into different pockets, while I'm also working on creating an early college learning center with the high school higher education and business partners that will address a critical mass need in that building. And we're very close to that. I don't want to speak too much about it because um, business people, venture capitalists like to, to, to run if things are too public too early. Sure. But it's very exciting. I will call it a success right now because I never in a million years thought we could possibly bring early college and, and higher education to the Blackstone Valley where there's a big gaping hole in it right now. So getting the community to buy in and that's not just the school committee, it's the community saying this build, the building made the decision for us, as some parents have said, and believe in a plan to reconfigure kids. That takes a lot of collaboration with other boards. It takes a lot of forums. You have to know, have, have an articulated plan that, that people believe in. So I think that's, and that, that's a shift from my earlier mistakes of doing things a little too, too quickly and slowing things down, being patient, being willing to sit in a room with people who may sit on the fence of a vote as long as we need to stay here until we get the support that we need or realize we're not going to get that support and we have to back up and go in a different direction. But you can't do that. You can't get to that point without sitting in the seat. There are things that I thought I knew as a principal. There are things I thought I knew as a director that prepared me for all of these things. It doesn't. It's a different world. Uh, it's, you're in a, I thought I was in a fishbowl as a principal. As a superintendent, you know, the life is, is 
in a fishbowl and, and, and you have to be willing to s celebrate your mistakes. Bring it to the forefront because I, I think sometimes people forget that we're human beings and, and as an educational leader, you have to use mistakes as a teachable moment. Most of my greatest learning experiences have been through mistakes. So, uh, Mr. Kearney, I'm going to adapt my planned question a little bit because it was going to ask you about a specific scenario, but I actually want to zero into the one you were just talking about, if I could. Um, Absolutely. So, in, in what seems like a very, very difficult and what I would imagine chal challenging to the community issue, so as you approach that in your collaboration with the community, with staff, with you mentioned the MSBA, can you talk specifically about how you handled communication mm -hmm. um, with the community and how specifically you managed the message when you consider that you had a government agency involved, the community, probably social media, um, <laughs> all, all of these things to deal with. Can you give us some specific examples of how right. you, you dealt with that communication? Well, the first thing I did was put a think tank together that had representation from each of the three boards, from people from past boards. So the population in Uxbridge, it's the opposite of what you have here. The, the, the population of, of families with uh, school-aged children is lower than our senior citizen population. So when you put that in perspective, 70% of the tax bill uh, people are feeling that provides no service to them anymore. But this building is their museum. They're rich in history in Uxbridge and many families, many generations have grown up there and, and come back or never left and, and have just stayed there. So while this building doesn't serve their needs anymore, you've got two things going on here. A problem though where parents don't want to send them their kids to it because it has asbestos issues. The, build, the building was built in 1937. I've actually had to close that building for a couple days in my first or second year because of mismanagement with it. So crisis management is another skill that I've learned uh, over time, or public relations, um, you know, mopping up messes uh, that you have to develop over time because there will be mistakes that happen and things to address. And, and how to handle that in, in, the, in the public uh, arena is, is very important. So as we were working on this plan, having a, a representation of all the parties who cared for different things. Um, and then arriving, getting them to arrive at a consensus. Simultaneously, a parallel effort there is getting our building leaders to believe and have confidence that they can take on more students in their buildings. Not only believe it, but get excited about it and really ready to carry the torch. So each of our leaders that have that big change, eighth grade is going to the high school. It's going to be part of the high school model. Um, is really something that's really exciting for the high school principal and the parents who are sending their kids there, believe it or not. Um, how that has continued to roll out, we have maximized social media. Some of the players on that team are actively involved, you know, with Facebook. Uh, it's a Facebook community more than Twitter um, or Instagram it, it, for our adult population anyway. So we certainly share documents. We create websites so that they can read up on enrollment projections to why are we doing this, to what it could become. Um, there's a veterans memorial in that building and there's a high percentage of, of veterans in, in the Blackstone Valley. They're very worried about what's going to happen to that. And I've said all along, nothing. Nothing's going to happen unless we make it better. And we're working on relationships that I think that we can turn that building into something special that we didn't know we could do two or three years ago. So again, this ties to other questions. How are you going to work with other people in the community? This is a people business. So you're just, each day that passes, you're, you're building a new relationship and you're, lear you're learning about people who's connected to a project or an initiative that you're trying to take from in the abstract to the tangible. And the next thing you know, you're in a room, like I just said, with people talking about a college president coming to town and let's see what we can do together. So um, that's, I, I think we've been very deliberate, um, but it got to a point where once the principals were confident that they could do it, we got the community that, that trusted that the students fit. The people who don't have the students in the school anymore trust us to say, 
listen, I'm not just going to hand this over to the Board of Selectmen and say, your problem now, go find a buyer for this. It has very little value than other than being a school. It, it was built in a time that you can't flip it into condos. Just can't be done. But it's on a beautiful campus with beautiful fields behind it, nestled into a beautiful community. I owe it, again, that's not the type of leader that I am of saying, I'll handle the school stuff, everyone else in your areas deal with your issues. I can't go to bed at night thinking that I just closed a building a year before it's due, got the school committee to believe in it, got this town to be okay with it, and then leave the building for someone else to figure out. No, we're going to flip this into something special. It may not be at the end of this year, it, it may come to fruition next year, but we're going to plant the seeds before my final day in the community for sure. And I'm, and I'm exceptionally confident um, about it. And more people are getting energized by it who are coming into that circle bright, you know, at, the, at this time. And I, and I think we have uh, a strong representation from, from people that are going to have to weigh in. Because I know what the stress is like for you folks when you have an A next to an agenda item on your agenda, which means action. You've got to make a vote on something. And you have to trust in your gut that this is the right thing for kids in the community. Mr. Carney, what do you think is the role of the superintendent in the classroom? And how do you identify and measure excellent teaching and learning? Okay. Can I answer the second part first? Sure. Okay. When I go into a classroom, um, I'm, first of all, I'm looking to see if the students are doing what the teacher intends um, the class to be doing. Second thing is I'm looking for the level of complexity of what we're asking kids to learn. And lastly, what's the, the role of the student in the instructional process? So if those three things are happening on a regular basis in a classroom, you can almost hedge a strong bet that those kids will be at grade level or, or above by the time that they're done in, in that school year. Th that, that is the blueprint um, for critical thinking skills among our students when they're sharing in the instruction. They're owning the instruction with the teacher. Um, the level of complexity that we're asking, are we asking kids to synthesize information, to deconstruct information, to break it down and create something new? Um, that's, that's rich instruction. Um, and what we do and how do we, how do we gauge the capacity for our administrators and for our teachers to find the root issues of things that need to improve, again, comes back to collaboration. So what we do on a monthly basis in my district is I take all of the administrators, including assistant principals and directors, and we meet at a school, the host principal will, and we've probably had a conversation of what we want to target in terms of our observation. Making sure that our teachers are aware that we're, look, we're, we're examining the work that people do. We're not examining people who do the work. Those are two different approaches. So we're not going in there with like white lab coats and, 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 and um, pads and writing down things that we like and what things. We're looking for trends. And then we're having conversations with teachers about a certain instructional approach or style. Because what that comes out of that is an identified need that they share in that decision as well too. So we're lining up professional development for either the following months or the following years in trainings that they have acknowledged we need to work on, okay? So when I go in, and usually I'm with the host principal and walking through a classroom and we're targeting something specific, we're really watching each other too. Are you observing what I'm, do you see what I see? And if we don't see what each other sees, why not? So if anyone's being evaluated at the end of those walkthroughs in each of the rooms, it's us, it's each other. And what we're seeing and why are we seeing something through two different lenses? Because there needs to be a commonality here. We need to have an identified approach to what we have to help our teachers with and coach our teachers with. And they have to be influential, our teachers and our support staff, on engaging us in conversations about what the what, what areas they need for help. And obviously, all, all of these discussions are research-based. So it's not something that we're pulling out of the hat and saying, we, we, we have to address this. It's, we know that it's about skills. It's not about A's or B's. I, I know we put a lot of to, uh, um, attention to transcripts 
and letter grades or, or number grades, are we focused on the skills that students need to be successful? And if we're focused, if we're skill oriented, the grades are going to come. Transcript's going to be okay. Um, so we do that month, monthly. I meet with each principal one on one um, monthly. We have a central office visit to each building monthly. We're talking about school improvement plans and how are they tying to district goals and how are they tied to your measured goals. Um, and if you're off track or if you're falling behind, what can we do to help to get you back on? And they do the same thing for me too. In some of our administration meetings, I'm saying goal number three, I'm like two months behind. It involves each and every one of you. How can we put this focus of attention for this month to move, so we make sure that, that we're, we're measuring it and we're achieving it? And sometimes there are some years that we have to abort some goals because you know what? We projected this eight months ago. We came into the year and guess what? It's just a different ball of wax and we have shifting priorities. And that's another thing that I've learned to do with school committees of saying, you know what, we prioritized this seven months ago. You know, if I was here and we were dealing with, with this with the building and the uh, high, I, I didn't know that I was going to be having a meeting like I'm going to be having tomorrow. Not even in my town. I got to come down to, well, it's, it's next door to where I live, but um, sometimes you got to leave the neighborhood to go meet where, where people who are going to help out your community. Um, but I know I, I just digressed a little bit there <laughs> That's um, okay. because I'm kind of passionate about this stuff. But staying on top of things with your team, keeping the conversation flowing about what matters most is what helps elevate the capacity for our instructional staff, our support staff, and yes, our administrators too. They need to continue. I think there's a lot of pressure on administrators sometimes to be the all-knowing leaders. No, we're not experts in everything. Um, and if you have a strong leadership team, each has a s very you know strong strength in certain areas. They, I don't use the word guru too much because I don't think anyone's really truly uh, an expert in anything. There's always room for growth. But do you balance each other off with your skills? And can we be assisting teachers and support staff um, in a way that we see blind spots and we want our staff to see my blind spots as an administrator on things that I can, that I can work on. We need to be open-minded with open ears to, to the things that we're not great at and be okay with it. Does that make sense? Sure. Thank did you. Did I answer your question because I went on forever? <laughs> no, you, you did. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, I think I'd like to ask you, um, f from the standpoint of your own career, what would be three of the most important accomplishments you've made as an educator in the last five years? And um, well, we'll start with that, and then maybe I'll have a follow-up for you. Okay. You guys are asking me questions that, that you know I can really go on for a long time. About. <laughs> Sorry. So I think it's important for any employer because whether they like it or not, as an, as a superintendent, it's going to be part of your legacy. When you had the opportunity to hire, did you hire well, or did you not? And I would say if you came to my district and you asked school committee members or for, former school committee members or people in the district. When Kevin's been involved, and I did change the hiring protocols in, in, in the system when I first arrived uh, to be diplomatic, but making sure that we're going with the most highly qualified candidate uh, for positions that fit well you know, with the community. I would say, if you were asking this question to someone else, what's my, my, my best strengths or, or greatest strengths or things that I've been successful at, they'd probably say I'm, I'm an effective employer who hires exceptionally well. I take, if I can be influential to the classroom on a regular basis, some, the, the pill that you swallow that, that's sometimes hard to swallow as a superintendent is you lose that day-to-day -day interaction in the classroom with teachers, with kids, and, and, and in a smaller setting in, in a school building that you get to know people's families at a deeper level. You get to know individuals at a deeper level. And that's what's great about being a principal, one of the best jobs you know, I ever had, if not the best job. But you know, to, to be influential on who gets hired to work with those kids, that's something special when you can take a step back and understand your new role in you know, the bigger picture kind, kind of place as a superintendent is. 
Um, so that's probably my, my greatest, um, or one of my better attributes, let's say. An another successful thing that I did, and I mentioned this last night, some sometimes the successes aren't out for public viewing. It's adjusting something that has been a major investment that you have determined is going to be a financial burden or something like that, or a transcript nightmare, a program, program and working behind the scenes with key players to shift the tides to making sure that investment that people have you know, given to the school department is shifted and corrected so that we're establishing program that leads to something for kids. And so it, again, some of my, some of the things that, that I would say are, 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 that I will leave the, the system with, very proud of, is that we've got a comprehensive guidance program that's instructional in nature from 6 through 12, and it will be expanded into the elementary grade levels. Um, we have flexible scheduling in each of our schools. Now, I don't do this by myself, mind you. I work with the team, but I, you know, you're influential in what, what, what's necessary for kids having open circle or first responsive classrooms where kids are having conversations with with their educators and practicing at the youngest uh, the grade levels handshaking looking people in the eye you you're, you're talking about how to recover from failure and be okay with it how do you be resilient how do you develop strong interpersonal skills with practice uh, how do you put kids into social situations because I'm pretty sure tomorrow, somewhere in my district, someone's going to be having an argument on a bus or at recess or at lunch. And you know what? Taking those situations and role playing them in the classrooms is very, really, really important learning for kids. And how does that shape? And how do you have that involved? So we, we've been doing that in our system where advisories become part of the middle school. While it's not formalized at the high school yet, there's an advisory-like structure because it's a small school. We have kids that are very involved. I would say over 90% of our kids, and that's not embellishing, are involved in some sort of activity, club, sport, um, you know, music group. And those advisors naturally serve that, and teachers too. So we have a flex schedule, a flex block in the high school where kids get access to teachers when they need to and teachers get access to kids. Um, it's alleviating a lot of stress because you know, you've seen it. Kids are getting up at 6.15 and getting on buses and they have jam-packed days and not come. Sometimes they're not even with you at dinner. They've got three or four hours of homework. It, it's more, it, it is a schedule that is probably more intense than many of us who work as adults and I think we have to do more about it and it's something that I think that I've done in our district with our principals to have common planning time with teachers in each of those schools so they're talking about what kids needs we're increasing conversations about kids they're they're learning what they need socially and emotionally and adapting to it so I I, I think over time those accomplishments in, in those areas of what I just said is, is something that I feel really good about in areas of strength that I can kind of be influential in those ways. There was another part to that question I think I missed though, wasn't it? Uh, I, I think that you, you hit the first part, but I, I was, I guess the follow up is, um, so, you know, what do you see then based on those accomplishments, what do you see are two challenges that you'd um, want to focus on if you were appointed as our superintendent? Um, I gave this, it, it builds off the story that I just said, and I'll use this tangible um, story where you have a high school student who is the captain of the soccer team, let's say, and is also an AP student uh, for, say, AP physics, has a test coming up, and needs to meet with the teacher because she really has a chance to grind out a three on the AP test. But she's only really got one shot to meet with this teacher and it's after school on Thursday. But her soccer team has their final practice before they enter the state tournament. And the coach and the team really need her there. She's torn, she's conflicted. This AP t uh, test and score is, is really important to her. It could put her into another stratosphere if she does well on it, right? But she also has her soccer team, her extended family, who she is, is very much a pull in that direction too. Um, 
I, I think that's something where we think those kids have it all together and it's not a stress on their day. It is. It really is. I was one of those kids. School's a grind for me. I don't want people in a community in, in, in Hopkinton where things are going so well to think that doesn't, nothing needs to improve or we don't need to, we, we can't be attentive to. There's a lot of competition going on from desk to desk in your classrooms here. The stress is self, partly self-inflicted because kids are signing up for classes to stay up with the Joneses, for lack of better expression. They feel it at home. And, and this doesn't always happen consciously. It happens subconsciously. The teachers have a tremendous amount of uh, stress and, uh, and with the administration to maintain that level of success that you're achieving. Um, what I would bring is a focus on let's build our education programs in schools to, to fit the kid. I became a guidance counselor. That was my first job as an educator. And it was because my guidance counselor saw behind the curtain of who I was trying to be for all the wrong reasons. So he was also my English teacher. He was just somebody that was very much involved in the holistic Kevin Carney and steering me in a direction of, this isn't you, man. You're taking courses that don't fit your skills and, and style and characteristics. He helped me th believe that intelligence isn't fixed. It's something that happens later. It is something that happens early for some people. You it involves. And intelligence is situational too. So if you find your niche, if you find your pathway, then you're gonna have a happy, successful life. I mean, to be 43 years old and be a superintendent for six years, talking to you in Hopkinton, one of the premier districts in the state. I don't know how I got here, but I know he helped me get here. And he inspired me to enter this field and do just what I'm saying I want to do on a broader scope. That's what probably made me transition from a guidance counselor to a principal to a director to a superintendent as, wow, I can be influential and start saying, work on goals from pre-K and K and let's build it up and formalize it and then we'll build the academic programs around those critical masses that we're finding in kids wanting to do. Doing that in Uxbridge. We're starting engineering and manufacturing in the eighth grade. They're gonna have five years of it. We were just invited down to Nashville because from a group from Massachusetts who took us down to the Nashville high schools to see their career academies. They have 12 career academies. We have kids down there that are taking a bus not going to the, the school across the street where they live, they're going across the, the city because their, their programs of studies, of what they're going to do in their lives is there and they're willing to take that and they're energized. Their attendance rates are going up. We were among four other, three other districts, more urban in nature, but they identified something that we're doing in Oxbridge, Massachusetts, that we want you to see this so that you can develop this in your region and maybe do some inter-district work on it. So they identified what was a problem, or I identified with our team that we had, I said yesterday, those of you who've been to um, Cheesecake Factory know that it has a menu that goes on forever. <laughs> you can flip those, those pages through an hour. We had a program of studies like that when I first got to, to Uxbridge. We were trying to fit everybody's need because our kids weren't getting into the regional vocational school. And I understand the thought process in doing that. But if you're just doing a course here and a course there, it's not doing anything to lead to skills. It's just looking good or potentially looking good on a transcript. So the, uh, the Hopkinton High School transcript, say three to five years from now, will have internships, job internships on there, or capstone projects, online courses. We want everyone to graduate with taking at least one online, uh, online course. They're gonna need to do that in college a given. We want them in a job internship for something that they continue, they want to continue their studies. They want to pursue that education further. And wouldn't it be nice when you're writing your college recommendations that you're not always going to the guidance counselor or the English teacher or the math teacher 
for the admissions office to read at the college that you're looking for? Wouldn't it be nice if employers from nearby companies are writing about the skills that you're already showing? That holds more weight, and, or it will hold more weight, I promise you this, than the number of AP or honors level classes that you have on your transcript. What skills have you developed before you leave our care that are going to prepare you? Because 20 years from now, 30 years from now, people aren't looking back at the high school transcript or the college transcript. That's what gets you in the door to have conversations like this. But when it's not working well, it's because people had a difficult time in working in a team. They couldn't problem solve. They couldn't self-motivate. They couldn't respond to failure and recover from it. They weren't resilient people. Those are the people that are having challenges maintaining long-term success in specific jobs or careers. Our kids will be prepared for that. Our kids' transcripts will have those job internships. They're going to leave here with good interpersonal skills and problem-solving skills. Now, some may be more advanced than others, but we're going to make sure that we're practicing this an awful lot so that they're marketable. Who they are as people is going to be a greater sell than what a piece of paper says. Thank you. Um, so is there anything that we didn't ask you that you wish we had, or is, are there questions that you have for us that we can answer um, for you? How many hours of interviews has this been so far? <laughs> so I think over, this is day three. Um, there, there have been, <laughs> someone's covered the question. Either you have asked it, um, I think, or someone from the other groups, but I, I think that um, we covered it. I just, um, I, I'm very, very thankful for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm, I'm very humbled by that. If, if my previous comment um, didn't, didn't show it, uh, I, I am. It's a tremendous district, given that you have so many things in place, and, and Dr. McLeod and her staff have really, and it's a compliment to them, when other superintendents, and I'll tell you, I live in Metro West, I've been an administrator in Metro West, I've been in Northern Worcester County, I've been in Southern Worcester County. So my network of superintendent peers go from Wellesley to Dudley Charlton. So when you hear about Hopkinton from these different regions, that it's ready to take off, it, it's a compliment to the work that they've done as a team here, what you've done. Um, I've watched, I've seen how the community interacts with one another, you have something going that's really, really um, strong, and people are jealous of it <laughs> from, from other communities. And um, to your process, for those who are watching at home, um, just how thorough um, you're, you're taking this responsibility and finding a, su a successor for Dr. McLeod um, shows, shows your values. It, it's, it's front and center, so I appreciate it being, and you made me so comfortable uh, it can be a nerve-wracking process, uh, but as an employer, as someone who is responsible for this on a day-to-day -day basis, I've always taken the approach that we want to market our community and our school system so people want to work here. It's not a one-way street in, in this process. Uh, you maybe want to be here. So, so um, th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, you much. very thank much. You. We really appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Do I have you. to leave now? I <laughs> <laughs> All good things must come to an end. Oh, right. right. So I'll, I can walk you out.